strap to three, reading from three to fifteen, second lesson from first John chapter five, reading from one to thirteen. And the first part I would like to draw attention to is first John chapter five verse three for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. I suppose we all agree with that. Yes? Okay, I'll take your silence for no. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. So the Bible states but I'd like to beg the differ. The commandments of God are in fact grievous. And when you go to the book of Exodus 20, you read it all very lethargically and practically. It all seems very easy pickings. But if you consider the first one, thou shalt have no other God beside me, I bet you, you ask Nebuchadnezzar, he will tell you how grievous that commandment is. After all, when he stood there, looking at what his hands had made, and proclaiming it in his heart, and speaking it out loud, he didn't know that the end would be as terrible as it was. But a man with all the power, and all the authority, and all the dominion over all the land, will now be rendered into nothing like an animal and be put out there in the forest amongst wild beasts for seven years. And you think about David also took upon himself the vesture of God and sat on his throne and determined the power of life and death over Uriah. The consequences David suffered as well, I guarantee you ask David, who will also tell you they were very grievous. The Lord talks about not creating any golden image or any image or any likeness of anything under heaven or bound down to it and as easy as it is ask the Israelites how many times they found it grievous and how many times they fell and bowed down to them even the very king that we were read about in first Kings chapter 3 Solomon for whom the Lord gave wisdom and understanding and declared that there will be no king like you before you or even after you he found that law grievous because you go to 1 Kings 11 verse 4 and 6 and you see where the Lord tells us that because of Solomon's love of the women and the lives in his, heart, in his life, what happened? They turned his heart from God and he also now began to worship pagan idols which the Lord found abominable. And because of that the Lord made a decree that even though I have made a covenant with your father, that his line will endure forever, I will not go back on my word. But twelve tribes I gave to you, and now I take ten away from you. Could you imagine that? This is the same Solomon that he said, there will be no king like him before or after him. And yet, even Solomon found that commandment quite grievous talk about taking his name in vain and you look at all the prophets that the Lord was calling about in the book of Jeremiah you even look at prophets today whom the Lord said they speak when they have not been sent and they say the Lord said when the Lord has not said they also find it grievous why? because it's so much easier to just give to the impulse and inclination of the heart the Sabbath day keeping the Sabbath day holy how many of us can truly say we are keeping the Sabbath day of the Lord holy especially how holiness is actually determined when in fact sometimes you get up in the morning you're grieved at heart you still get up and you go but deep inside you really know where you want to be and it goes on and on and on thou shalt not kill yet david killed yet moses killed yet Saul of tarsus killed these were all people who found these commandments grievous and over and over again, adultery, we know about Dave, we don't know about Goma, we know about the woman who was caught in the very act, who was about to be stoned to death until Jesus should step in, which when those who stood to condemn her, and he 
her savior. Again, she would tell you that she found that commandment grievous. I shall not covet, I shall not steal. Jacob, another person again whom the Lord again calls his own, began his very life and his very journey by stealing, by deception, over and over and over and over again, until the Lord should revisit him with the very weapon with which he had dashed others to pieces. But he found it grievous, David found it grievous, and on and on and on it goes. Now where am I going with this? When you also remember the story of the rich man who accosted Christ in Matthew 19 and he said, Good Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Matthew 19 from verse 16. And Jesus was turned to him and said, Why do you call me good? There is none good but the Father in heaven. He said, You know the commandments? He says, Which one shall I keep? He says, All of them. I shall have no other God beside thee. Thou shalt honor thy father and thy mother. Love thy neighbor as yourself. He said, All these I have kept since my youth. And the Lord never disputed that. That as concerning the law, he was perfect. Yet then the Lord said to him, We have one thing thou lackest. And he said, What? Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor. And you shall have treasures in heaven. Now come, follow me. And the Bible said the rich man turned away, sorrowful and grieved in his heart. He found that commandment grievous. And then you go to the book of Job 7 from verse 17. Job again, whom the Lord declares, there is none righteous like him. And what does Job tell us? From 7 from verse 17. What is man that thou shouldest magnify him, that thou shouldest set thine heart upon him, and that thou shouldest visit him every morning and try him every moment? How long wilt thou not depart from me, nor let me alone, till I swallow down my own spittle? I have sinned. What shall I do unto you? What does my sin do to affect you? O thou preserver of men, why hast thou set me as a mark against thee, so that I am a burden to myself? Job found his commandment so grievous, he said, why don't you just let me alone? Why are you marking me at every single point? Why have you turned me to your enemy? Just let me be. My days are brief and swift. Let me spend them, all the sorrowful days you've given me, and let me alone. Why? Because he found the commandments of God rather grievous. And of course, a man we all know and a passage we're all familiar with in Romans 7, where Paul declares in verse 15, the very good I want to do that I do not do, but yet the evil that I would not, the evil that I should not, that I find myself doing. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Even Paul declares, he finds the laws of God grievous. Why? Because in him he desires to follow the law, but yet there is another law at work in his members that is preventing him from following the law. So when you are in fact at war within yourself, of course you're a wretched man. Who can deliver you? But yet, here is Christ telling us again in 1 John, his commandments are not grievous. So either Christ is lying or we are missing something. And Christ is the truth. God forbid that he should ever lie. So I'd like to believe that we have actually missed something. But here's an interesting thing. In that Matthew 19, after the rich man had said what he said and he left, Jesus now pontificated and said, how hard it is for the rich to inherit the kingdom of heaven. Behold, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And then the apostles who heard it said, who then can be saved? Because they knew he wasn't just talking about a rich man who had riches and possession. We are all rich in something or the other. Whatever virtues you hold on to, whether you feel you're the most humble like Job, whether you feel you're the most loving, whether you feel you're the most zealous, whether you feel you know this or you know that, those things are your riches. So the disciples understood it wasn't just talking about those who had great possessions. He's talking about every one of us. And that's why they were perplexed. Who then can be saved? But Jesus answered one thing. He said, with man it is what? Impossible. It is impossible. But with God, all things are what? All things are possible. Yet here's an interesting thing. People then say Jesus came and he softened everything because in the Old Testament we're dealing with this God who is taking kingdoms away from Solomon, this God who is killing the firstborn child of David, this God who is killing 400,000 Exodus generation of the Egyptians, this God who revisits iniquity with instant judgment. 
But here comes Christ, just preaching love and forgive each other. So everybody says Christ came to make it better. But I completely disagree. If you truly understand what Christ came to do, you realize not only did he not come to make it better, he actually made the standard even harder. He made it impossible. The Ten Commandments are one thing. The rich man could easily do that. He had been doing it his entire life. But Jesus now gave a new commandment that even someone who had been following all the commandments perfectly his entire life could not get to. Think about that. This rich young man, as concerns the law, was perfect. And yet, because of that one thing Jesus asked him to do, Jesus knew he was so far from the kingdom of God. And he said he called him to make it easier. And all you have to do, beloved, in Christ is go to the book of Matthew and read from verse 20 to 48. Matthew 5. And you see what the Lord is saying there, the commandments he's given. Those things will positively drive you mad. Number one, the first thing he talks about, blessed are the pure in spirit, pure in heart, for they shall see God. Who can make his heart pure? He talks about, yes, it is written, thou, thou shalt not commit adultery, but I tell you, whoever even looks lustfully at a woman is already guilty of adultery. And you tell me he's making it easier. He says, I tell you, there's a truth that they said, an eye for an eye, but a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you the truth, forgive your enemies. Do not resist evil. Love your enemies. If they slap you on the left, turn the right cheek. This is what this Christ is now coming to preach. All these things that make no sense. If your right arm causes you to sin, cut it off. If your left eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Are you telling me that Jesus came to lower the standard? He, in fact, increased the standard. And just to let you know how positively more difficult Jesus made it, he concluded his discussion in Matthew 5 and verse 48. Be ye perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Well, some people will say, well, he didn't really mean that. The love it in Christ. He meant every word of that statement. It wasn't hyperbole. Be ye perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. We can't even achieve perfection on earth. We can't even attain to the righteousness of David, of Moses, all of whom are all sinners before God. And yet Christ is now saying, not only am I asking you to attain to that, go even higher, I need you to be a perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. And when you read all this, you have to understand that Jesus was about a very strange business, something that was very, very revolutionary, something different from anything we've been used to up to that point. Then I go back to the second reading in 1 John chapter 4, chapter 5 rather, and read him from verse 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcome at the world, even our faith. This sounds like a lot of begot, begotten. But I want you to just spend a minute or two on those two words. Begot and begotten. It's very important. Whosoever believeth that Jesus the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begot, loveth him that is begotten. And who's the one that is begotten? Jesus. Christ. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only what? He's only begotten son. So here's the difference. And this is what we mean by begotten. When you beget something, you quite literally recreate something in your exact replica. When you begot something, if I give birth to a child, I have begotten a child, and you look at that child, particularly my third one, and everybody looks and goes, is that your child? Yeah, it's very obvious. They look like you, they have your attributes, they have a lot of your traits, they start to sound like you, because you what? You begat that child. When you make something, it's different. You cannot make something in your exact replica. An artist, a sculptor, will make a statue. A statue may look like someone, but it doesn't have any of the life or the attributes of that person. 
I can make a statue of Michael Jordan and put it out there in Chicago. They can make a statue of Kobe Bryant and put it out there out of the Staples Center, but the statue can't move. It can't do anything Kobe does. It has none of the mannerisms, the characteristics or life of Kobe, but it only has a certain physical resemblance. And that's it. So when God begat his only son, God literally recreated someone exactly like him. And the only person who did that was his son Jesus. The rest of us he did what? He made after his image. Do you understand the difference there for a moment? Yes. So when you now think about it, the created one, the created son, Adam, Adam failed. The begotten son, Jesus, succeeded. Because what? Romans 5.19 reads, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one man shall many be made righteous. So unless we also become begotten like Christ, we are doomed to fail. If we continue like Adam, as created things, we can never make it into the kingdom of God. Unless we become begotten exactly as Christ himself was begotten of his father. There is no life in us. And you think about it. For whom then is the law of God not grievous? That's what 1 John 5 was telling us. In verse 4, for whatsoever is born of God, whatsoever is begotten of God, overcometh the world and this is the victory that overcome the world even our faith so for those of us who are still naturally minded who are still walking up and down like adam in that created image of course the laws of god are grievous they're difficult they're impossible says paul you are walking around and there are two laws at war inside your heart one says do the other one says do not one says touch the other one says touch not how can anybody survive that even if you survive it today, somebody said to me, you know, if you follow a driver for long enough, any driver, no matter how perfect their record, you will catch them breaking one law. And it's true. There is nobody who can go for six hours, ten hours without at least breaking one law. Whether you swerve accidentally, whether you go 50 where it says 45, no matter what it is, if you follow someone long enough, you will catch them breaking the law. And it's the same thing with the natural mind. If you walk in God and try to do it according to the commandment, you will fail. It's as simple as that. And think about what the Lord now said. He said the made man or the created son turned out to be a great disappointment to him. Genesis 6.6 6. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. But yet concerning his son, he says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son, in whom I am what? Well pleased. So you see the distinction. There's one son that pleases him, there's another one that grieves his heart. But then what is the Lord saying? How can we accomplish this becoming begotten? John chapter 3 from verse 1. And there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews. The same came Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, and for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell from whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel? I know not these things. And Jesus had quite a sense of humor, because he's really playing with Nicodemus here. Because he knows what he has told Nicodemus absolutely makes no sense to the natural mind. 
And when Jesus says thou must be born again, you know, the, 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 the whole idea of being born again, Christian churches do one of two things with it. They either oversimplify it by saying all you have to do is confess Jesus is your Lord and Savior and you're born again. Absolutely not. Or they overcomplicate it. I want to explain to you what Jesus thought really were, what it really meant, how he really wanted you to go about it, which again is also not true because you cannot tell me that by your superior intellect you somehow can explain Jesus, who himself is the end of all explanation. When he says you must be born again, that is exactly what you mean. So how then can we be born again? A question Nicodemus asked that I think we should ask more often. And if we can just go for a moment into the uh, mystery of uh, conception. Most of you probably know, even the children have been taught this in their school. So about two weeks prior to a woman's monthly flow, what happens? She starts to ovulate. And somehow you've got all these eggs that are packed in this sack filled with fluid. There's follicles. And one egg somehow bursts open. It literally escapes out of this follicle. When the egg now escapes, it goes and travels and hibernates in the fallopian tube, awaiting the sperm to come and what? Activate it, to fertilize it. If nothing happens and it isn't fertilized, it disintegrates and it just passes on from the body of the woman. Nothing happens. But then if one arrives, what happens? The sperm actually literally has to burrow and knock and knock and knock and break into the egg. And if it successfully breaks into the egg, what happens? The egg becomes fertilized. And the moment the egg now becomes fertilized, it now moves again and goes and through, the, what's the process? Implantation, I think for our nurses here and doctors. Uh, is it implantation? Yes, after, yes, but the process where it actually attaches itself to the uterus, it's implantation. Yes, where it goes and attaches itself to the uterus during the process of implantation and what happens. But the moment it is fertilized, it's very interesting. The very moment that egg is fertilized, the genes start to develop. The sex of the child is already defined. If the sperm contains Y chromosomes, it's gonna be a what? A boy, very good. If it contains X chromosomes, it's what? It's a girl. But the moment the fertilization happens, all these become defined. And it remains there in the uterus for the next nine months until the time of delivery. Now, somebody will ask me what does this have to do with being born again? The concept of going into conception isn't very different from the concept of being born again. The proof may be different, the end result may be different, but the process is exactly the same. Something has to come together. You know, it's funny when... when um, when you think about it, being born again and this rebirth, something has to come from without to touch what is within and create this new begotten child. And somebody asked a question because the angel said to Mary, thou shalt be with child. And Mary said unto the angel, how shall this be? Seeing what? I know not a man. The angel was talking about spiritual thing. She was thinking of the physical one. I don't know a man. How can I be with child? I don't want you to listen to the answer. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the Most High shall overshadow thee. The power of God will overshadow thee. And when it does, listen to this, Therefore that holy thing, which shall be born of thee shall be called what? The Son of God. Luke 1 from 34 to 35. That holy thing that will be conceived after the power of the Holy Ghost overshadow you shall be called the Son of God. Likewise, that holy thing that is going to be created in you is no longer just going to be your eye, is now going to be called the begotten Son or Daughter of God. 
But Romans 8.22 reads, We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, even unto this present time, awaiting the manifestation of the sons of God. So even the Lord himself uses the same analogy. The whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth. So there is a similarity there. But you go again to Romans 8, 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did what? Predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he might now be, not the only begotten son, but the firstborn amongst many brethren. He said, I have now created this Jesus. He's the perfect man. He's exactly what I hoped Adam would be. He's exactly what I hoped Eve would be. Adam failed, Eve failed, you have all failed. For all are fallen short of the glory of God. But he, this Jesus, is the perfect man. And now I want to make him the firstborn amongst many who will be exactly like him. Exactly like him. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even the them who believe on his name. This is John 1 from 12, I'm reading. Even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Many, you have nothing to do with it. It is not your will that will make you into this begotten son or daughter. It is not flesh and blood that will make you into this flesh, into this begotten son. But rather, it is God himself who is going to accomplish this through the mystery of his Holy Ghost. What is the Lord saying to us here? The process of rebirth of being born again is a mysterious one. And again, while it is different from the physical process of conception, it is not unlike the concept of conception. There must be a powerlessness in man in this process. What power did Mary have? And the same way a woman, if you think about it, they'll say, well, what is a man's duty? Simple. Do not resist it. The same purpose, the same action a woman serves in conception is the same one all of us serve in the spiritual rebirth because you simply have to receive him. You simply have to not deny him. You simply have to not resist him. You simply have to not fight him. You simply have to accept this Christ and what he's doing inside you. He says in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand knocking at the door. If anyone should hear my voice and open, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. So when he starts knocking upon that door, your goal is simply not to resist it. But it sounds very easy and it sounds like an oversimplification of salvation. But it's not. It's not. And it's not an instantaneous process. Just like again, when a woman conceives, you cannot start saying, oh, there is a baby. Yes, we congratulate her because we start to see the signs. But the problem with Christianity is, once all of us start to again experience what I call the ecstasies of worship, we start to speak in tongues, we start to prophesy, we start to shake, have dreams, we believe we've been perfected. The ecstasies have nothing to do with the perfection of becoming begotten. It's like a woman who starts to have morning sickness, then all of a sudden she wants to have a naming ceremony the next day. That's not a long process. You've just begun the first trimester. The child starts to conceive, the child starts to show, you start to move, but anything can still happen. Until that child is delivered, the job is not done. And until the Holy Ghost has completed that work, the job is not done. Which is why a lot of churches go about and say, once you speak in tongues, you have the Holy Ghost and you're fine. And yet, we start seeing behaviors of these so-called Christians that we call ourselves. And you go, where's the Christ in that? I have the Holy Ghost, yet I'm still angry. I still can't forgive. I'm still given to adultery. I'm still given to envy. I'm still given to backbiting. I'm still given to jealousy. Yet I have the Holy Ghost and I've been born again. Are you kidding me? Show me where Christ exemplified any of that. Jesus is not saying, I'm coming here to make you into an image like me. I am giving you the power to become exactly like me. So the evidence has to absolutely match it. There are precautions a woman takes once she gets pregnant. Certain things she must not do to ensure that child isn't harmed. 
And similarly, Christians have certain responsibilities. Once the Holy Ghost starts to work, you have to nurture it with the Word of God. You have to nurture it with attention to Christ. You have to nurture it with meditation and prayer and fellowship and self-modification and self-denial. The same way a woman who's pregnant can't really drink, can't smoke, can't do all those things that are dangerous or could endanger that child. And there is a process, there is a mature process, and there is a time which after nine months, the child is then born. And if we don't pass through that process, a lot of us hinder the process and we ask, well, where is God in all of this? That's in 1 John 5. Talks about this wonderful Holy Ghost from verse 6. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. And I want you to think about this. This water and blood, instead of a double entendre, it has two meanings. He came by water and blood, meaning what? He came, number one, naturally. The water of a woman breaks, he experienced that. She bleeds, he experienced that. But then it also means the water again, his baptism and the blood, his death. He experienced all of that. So this is the one that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Then I love this. Then it continues, not by water only. And I ask the Lord, what do you mean again? And why do you have to repeat that, not by water only? And the Lord was saying, he's talking about the resident glory of Christ. And what does it mean by that? When you go to the very beginning, in Genesis 1, from 1 to 2, says the Spirit of the Lord moved upon the face of the water. The earth was without form and void. The only thing that existed then was the deep was water. Jesus was that water. Jesus was that one receiving the Spirit of God. Jesus himself was that water. And think about this for a moment. Colossians 1.17. It reads, And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. He is before all things and by him all things consist. I want you to think about that. The entire earth is 70% water. Man is 70% water. There is nothing on the face of this earth that can live apart from water. Plantation, animal, anything. Jesus is the one who consists in everything. But again, don't stop there. In Numbers 28, in Numbers 20, verse eight, and we all know the story, but listen to this. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother. And do what? And speak ye unto the rock before their eyes. Now listen to this. And it shall give forth his water. It didn't say it shall give forth the water. It shall give forth his water. Who is that rock if not Christ? Who is that water he's talking about if not Christ? And this is why John 7, 13 reads, Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water shall flow out of him. I will give him of myself. That's the living waters. So when he says, and by water alone, he's also saying that this is this Christ. He didn't come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit that beareth witness because the spirit is truth. And this is the composition of the Holy Ghost. Verse 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, that is Christ, and the Holy Ghost, and the three are one. And there are three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and this three agree. This is the composite of the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God, the water, which is of Christ, and the blood, which is the life of Jesus in this world. If you're going to walk like Jesus, if you're going to be able to overcome this world like Jesus, you need everything that sustained him. The spirit of the Father, that water which is Christ, and the blood which is the life of Jesus that he lived. Those three things are the composite of the Holy Ghost. Without that, no Christian can make it before him. And that's why the Lord was saying that. At the end of the day, there is a condition in order for man to receive this. And it continues in verse 9, if we receive the witness of men, and the witness again is again referring to the Holy Ghost, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God, which hath testified of his Son. 
He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself, and he that believeth not God hath made him a liar. He that believes has this witness in himself, has this Holy Ghost in himself. And this is the record, that God had given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. And he that hath the Son hath the life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not the life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So very quickly, what is the condition of really receiving? That's Holy Ghost. If somebody can read very quickly 1 Corinthians 1 from verse 26. Quickly. For you see your calling. For you see your calling. Brethren. Yes. How that not many wise men after the flesh. Not many mighty. Not many wise after the flesh. Yes. Not many mighty. Not many mighty. Not many noble. Not many noble. Are called. Are called. But God had chosen the foolish things but of the world. But he chooses the foolish things of the world. Yes. To confound the wise. To confound the wise. And God had chosen the weak things he of the world. He chooses the weak things. I want you to think about what God upholds. The very thing you look down on is what he's telling you is the condition on which you are even worthy. Have been made use by him. Foolish things. Yes. To confound the things which are mighty. Yes. And weak base, things. And yes. Base things of the world. The base things of the world. And things which are despised. And things which are despised. Are God chosen. Are God chosen. Yea, and things which are not. Yes. To bring to naught things that are. Things that are not, that have no glory, have no honor. Those are the things I choose again to completely nullify the things that I think they are. Yes. That no flesh should glory in his that presence. That no flesh may glory in his presence, yes. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus. Yes. Who of God is made unto us wisdom. Yes. And righteousness. Yes. And sanctification. Yes. And redemption. Yes. That according to it is written. Yes. He that glory, he that glory in him. Let him glory, let him glory in, the in the Lord. Thank you. Think about these conditions for a moment. And ask yourself, can you even accomplish this? The weak things of the world. And yet, all we ever want to do is show our strengths. The base things of the world. And yet, all we ever want to do is talk from the mountain to mountain top of our virtues. The things that are not. The things that aren't regarded. And yet, all we seek day and night is recognition. Whether in our homes, whether in church, whether at work. These are the things we seek. And yet, he's saying the very opposite is what I am looking for. You can't make yourself weak. You can't make yourself base because there is a nature in you that seeks to do the opposite, that seeks to lift itself up, that seeks to defend itself, that seeks to fight for itself, that seeks to be noticed. Think about that for a moment. And yet this is what Christ is saying. And when you actually try to accomplish it on your own, you know, our, our Father in the Lord preached last week and was talking about strange fires. And he said a lot of things that make sense. You can't bring strange fires before the Lord. But I want you to take it very, very quickly. To that Leviticus 10 from verse 1 to 2 that was read last week. It says, Nadab and Abihu offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not to. And because of this, fire broke out from the altar and consumed them. But why was this fire strange? Why are we strange when we try to do it ourselves? You go to Leviticus 6, from 12 to 13. Interest of time, you can read it on your own. It talks about a fire that is perpetually burning in that altar that never dies. There was a fire in the inner altar that never ever was quenched, day or night. 365 days of the year, that fire was a fire from God itself. And the Lord now commanded, if you go to again Leviticus 16 from verse 12, it says, go take fire from that inner altar, from that fire that never burns, and burn incense to me. That is where the priests were supposed to take the fire from. So then if you now decide, well, I'm not going to take the fire from there, I'm going to go take the fire from outside, that is strange fire before God. Because it didn't come from him. It is coming from you. Likewise, when you now try to do it on your own, you are bringing strange fire before God. Which fire does God desire? The second lesson from last week told us, Ephesians 5, 2, and walk in love as Christ also had loved us and had given himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling server. Christ is the only incense God wants before him. 
God isn't interested in you and what you think you can do. He's only interested in his son inside you. When God loves you, it is not you he loves, but the image of his son, the personification of his son inside you. He says, no clean thing can, no unclean thing can come before me. The heavens he called unclean. Even the angels he charges with unworthiness of being before their presence. How much more we who drink iniquity day and night. The only incense he wants before him is that fragrance called Christ. There is no other way to do it. And this is how he accomplishes it. He convicts you. Then he tells you, come to me. And when you come to him, what does he do? He reveals your corrupt nature to you. And when he sees it, how do you respond? And that's where many of us turn back. Enough. And we run back. Oh Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Forgive me. I know I have a problem with anger. Take it away from me. And then all of a sudden, well, you're not being angry anymore. So you think the work is done. You know, George MacDonald said something. He says, when Christ decides to work in you through the Holy Ghost, it's like somebody who comes to your house and says, I'm here to do repairs. And you know the pipe is broken. You know there's a window that is broken and he comes, he fixes the pipe, he fixes the window, he fixes the broken uh, uh, chandeliers as well. And you say, well, everything is done. But then he starts knocking the walls down. Now you go, whoa, 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 what are you doing? You thought he was just coming to fix a pipe and things, but he's coming to take down the entire house. You thought he was going to live you in a nice little cottage, but he's going to create a palace, John McDonald says. Because he's the king of kings and he desires to live in a palace. He would destroy everything, everything that is contrary to him and build you back up. And this is where the work is. This is where we resist him. This is where most of us say, this is too hard. This is why many of the disciples he called all left him and said, this is a hard teaching. And this is where a lot of us get stagnant in Christianity. Oh, well, we have perfected. We come to church on time. We pray. We stay and pray for people. Read our Bible every now and then. I don't curse. I fast. So I'm good. And that's why he said, many, many will say to me, let the Lord, we cast out demons in your name. We healed in your name. We prophesied in your name. And he'll say, away from me, you evildoers. I never knew you. Who do you think he's talking to if not you and I? There is something that has to be accomplished beyond what you're capable of. And all he wants you to do is come to him. Tell him, I need you to do it. I cannot do it by myself. He will start to reveal things to you that will scare the heck out of you. And he uses the people in your life. He's not going to come and do it spiritually in a dream. It's your wife that is going to torment you. It's your husband that is going to torment you. It's your children that are going to torment you. It's your best friend that is going to hurt you and disappoint you. It's your colleagues, your employer that he's going to use. It's your members in the church that are going to do and say things to you that are going to devastate you. But you look at them as they're the ones doing it and yet Christ is revealing something to you. If you're still responding to this, if you're still affected by it, what is Christ revealing? He doesn't care about the little hurt. He cares about the ultimate end, making you a begotten son. And he will stop at nothing to accomplish it. It is a painful process. It isn't an easy one. Christianity isn't cheap, beloved, in Christ. You can't just hold a candle and believe I've got this, I've got that, and I'm just going to walk into it. Think about what Christ himself went through. If the Son of God went through this, do you think he will ever chip in at a single moment? Or an iota for you. But he knows you cannot do it. And he says, come to me and I'll do it in you. But I need you not to fight me. When I convict you, when I reveal to you how corrupt we are. So many of us would rather take stock of ourselves. We don't want God to do it. I know where I'm wrong. I know where this, I know where that. Rather than letting the spirit of God search us out. The problem is when the spirit of God does it. He searches not to level one. He goes to the very depths of hell to show you how absolutely corrupt you are and how deep your wickedness runs. You look at other people and go, how could you? I love when people say that. How could David have done that? How could Solomon have done that? How could Israel have done that? How could Peter have still denied him? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Do you not see yourself? We don't even know when we're even sinning. We say things so naturally. And you don't know how the Lord judges you. He says outside you're like whitewashed tombs, but inside you're filled with dead men's bones. Peter thought he was perfect. 
pray that you don't have one to tempt Jesus saw what was inside Peter. This fear that Peter had of death was so great that he knew Peter would stop at nothing to deny him. Peter denied him even with cursing when they said, you are one of his followers. He cursed the girl who said that to him. Until the Lord reveals how hopeless and horrific you are. Until the Lord shows you how corrupt your nature is. You're not ready for it. And he does it using the people in our lives, using our very situations. You think your virtue is love? Beautiful. Now love someone that is your enemy. Now love someone that in your heart you loathe and absolutely want to see die. Now love someone you feel nothing for. And then come tell me you're my son. You think you're humble? Here is a test. And just say this. And this is just something I'm going to read very quickly. I'm rounding up now. There is a prayer that Raphael Cardinal uh, Mary Del Val, the secretary of uh, Pope Pius X, um, put together. It's called the Litany of Humility. And I'm just going to read it to you. And ask yourself if this is a prayer you can say. If you honestly cannot say it, you're not there yet. Listen to this. Oh Jesus, meek and humble of heart, hear me. From the desire of being esteemed, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being loved, from the desire of being extolled, from the desire of being honored, from the desire of being praised, from the desire of being preferred to others, from the desire of being consulted, from the desire of being approved, from the fear of being humiliated, from the fear of being despised, from the fear of suffering rebukes, from the fear of being calumniated, from the fear of being forgotten, from the fear of being ridiculed, from the fear of being wronged, from the fear of being suspected, that others may be loved more than I. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it, that others may be esteemed more than I, that in the opinion of the world, others may increase and I may decrease, that others may be chosen and I set aside, that others may be praised and I unnoticed, that others may be preferred to me in everything, that others may become holier than I, provided that I may become as holy as I should before you. Can anybody really read this and believe that they actually believe that? Can anybody sit here and tell me in truth that you really pray that others may be preferred above you? But this aren't just words. This is exactly what Jesus personified. Finally, this new man we're talking about, these are some of the characteristics. 2 Corinthians 5.17 reads, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, and all things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Galatians 2.20 reads, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, meaning that old man, whoever I am today, is completely crucified. You know, it's funny, Christ always says, take what? Take your cross and what? And follow me. I want you to think about it for a moment. In the days of the Romans, when they crucified people, whoever was carrying their cross never came back. If you carry your cross, you're going to die. You're never coming back. So when Christ says, take your cross and follow me, he's asking you, follow me to Golgotha, where I'm going to crucify that natural mind, crucify that one that thinks it's good, crucify that one that thinks it's humble, crucify that one that thinks it's righteous, crucify that one that thinks it deserves to be loved or honored. You deserve nothing. Nothing. There is nothing we're not capable of. I am capable of murder in the right circumstance. I am capable of becoming a drug addict given the right circumstance. There is nothing hopeless out there I am not capable of. And this is what Jesus is saying to you. And it lives in you, but Christ is able to get at the source of that corruption. If only you let him have his way. And quit believing that by your own strength you can do it. You simply have to let him have his way and call upon him day and night. And tell him you cannot do it. Tell him you desire to become that begotten. And whatever it takes to bring me there, bring me there. And don't get lost in depression when the Lord says we should move. Don't get lost in sorrow when the Lord says rise up and move. 
How do you take somebody's wife from them? A wife you love so much, and you tell him the night before you do it, Ezekiel, son of man, with one blow, I'm going to take the apple of your eye, but do not weep or shed a tear. Are you kidding me? And why did he do it? He was sending a message to Israel. Today, somebody said, whoa, 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 you can't send a text or something to them. You have to kill my wife to prove it. But he killed her, and Ezekiel could not mourn even for his wife. He told Hosea, go marry a prostitute. She's going to give you bastard children, but I want you to do it. I'm sending a message to Israel. He took his only son and put him through hell and high water. And then he says, it was my desire to crush him for your sake. This is the God we serve, beloved in Christ. At the end of the day, this is my final word. Solomon asked for one thing. Give me wisdom and an understanding heart to judge these people. And it was a good thing he asked for, but it was not the perfect thing. Because even with the wise and understanding heart he had, what happened? He still was turned away from God and turned to idolatry. So that wise and understanding heart still could not save him. And that's the problem. A lot of us ask for wisdom and understanding, to understand ourselves, to understand our fellow man. But nothing comes from that. Satan has gotten us so busy, chase us. This entire world now, everywhere you go, understand yourself, learn yourself, search yourself, do this yourself. Nothing comes from it. You're chasing your tail about. There are all sorts of zodiac signs and this test and that test to prove it. Then you want to understand your neighbor, you want to understand your spouse, and 20, 30 years later, you still don't understand this person you've been sleeping and living with. Because they do things that just perplex you. But the goal really should be understanding God in Christ. Because when you understand him, he gives you the understanding of yourself. He gives you the understanding of your neighbor. There is nothing else. And that is why he says in the book of what? Jeremiah? Don't worry, I promise. It's the last quote. I know I've been saying that over and over again. He says what? In Jeremiah 9, 23 to 24. He says, Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exercises love and kindness, judgment and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. And since no one has seen the Father except the Son, therefore there is no way to know the Father except you know the Son, who is the invisible, who is the image of the invisible God. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, even his Son Jesus Christ. Listen to what he says about Jesus in 1 John 5, 20 to 21. This is the true God and eternal life. It says Jesus is the true God and he's the eternal life. There is no other God for Christians but Christ. He is God above us. He is the Father that is going to beget us. He is God with us, walking with us through the valley of the shadow of death. And he is God in us as the Holy Ghost willing and having his way in us. Christ is the beginning and the end of all understanding. Come to him. Tell him in earnest, I want to know you. Like Paul said, I desire to know nothing amongst you except Christ and him crucified. And he will bring us into the accomplishment of thy glory. May the Lord bless his holy word. Amen.